Hi, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to attend the Stepping Up Summit. Unfortunately, I'm not able to be there in person, but I wanted to address your very important meeting. Although there are violent, mentally ill offenders who need to be incarcerated, I agree with you that there are steps that can be taken to reduce the number of offenders with mental illness who are in jail. The Senate Judiciary Committee passed what's called the Comprehensive Justice and Mental Health Act last year. That legislation provides services to individuals with mental illness who come into contact with the criminal justice system. It provides grants to provide offenders with mental illness with substance abuse treatment. It provides services for veterans with mental illness who face criminal charges. It authorizes grants to develop alternatives to hospital and jail admissions for frequent users of crisis services. The bill passed the Senate in December and is awaiting action in the House of Representatives. Additionally, the Senate Judiciary Committee held a hearing recently on mental health legislation. We're interested in providing improved services to people with mental illness so that actions that could lead to police contact can be actually prevented. Last year, the committee held a hearing on indigent misdemeanor representation. There are many individuals accused of just simple misdemeanors who have mental illness. We raised attention to the idea that some of the less serious misdemeanors might be better off uh, turned into civil infractions that can only be punished with fines. We also showed that convictions for misdemeanors, which are easy to obtain without the assistance of a lawyer, can lead to imprisonment and other collateral consequences that can be avoided. Now, you know, jail is not the best place for people with mental illness to receive the services they need. So I hope you know that I appreciate the work that you're doing to avoid very costly jail sentences for people with mental illness who do not pose a threat to public safety. Representative government is a two-way street. So I want you all to know that I welcome the dialogue with you on how to improve the treatment of our fellow citizens. So I once again thank you for the invitation, but I surely wish you the best of wishes for your summit. Great, thank you very much. That was, for those of you who don't know, uh, Senator Chuck Grassley, the chairman of the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee uh, from Iowa, Republican. Uh, one of the great things about working on this issue, we all talk about uh, people coming together across the political spectrum from health communities, from justice communities, public safety, uh, judges, public defenders, etc. cetera. Um, really quite exciting, and many of you who follow politics know probably not many issues that Senator Grassley, uh, and we're gonna hear from Senator Franken this evening, um, agree on. Uh, this is one topic where you're gonna hear a lot of common ground, so uh, pretty neat um, to have them uh, really be involved in all this. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Mike Thompson, I'm the director of the Council of State Government's Justice Center. Uh, pleased to be working with Matt Chase and, and Paul Burke and, and their terrific teams on this wonderful summit. Uh, we had a wonderful kickoff uh, panel from the leaders of all of our different groups and associations and then I think really inspiring keynote messages from uh, Dr. Osher and from Judge Leifman. This is the part now where we kind of bring it home, where we really bring it back now to the county level and how all this really does get translated uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And, um, hopefully all of you have had a chance to look through your materials and you've seen in it uh, this document right here. Uh, it says, um, reducing the number of people with mental illness in jail, six questions county leaders need to ask. Uh, you'll recall Dr. Osher previewing those six questions uh, in his opening remarks. Um, I think you'll agree with me that when you look at those six questions, pretty easy to say, yep, 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 doing that, got it, all good, um, everything's fine. Uh, what we're going to do is drill down a little bit more into those questions and apply a little bit more scrutiny because I think um, what really uh, uh, brings everybody together here is number one, 
lots of people making headway on those questions, but also uh, lots of people who are sophisticated enough to know that in fact there's a long ways to go before they can really satisfy all six of those questions. And so it was with that in mind that we put together this opening, plenary, this opening panel uh, discussion. We're going to actually have two parts to it. Um, we're going to have the first part look at questions one through three. Then we're going to give you some time to talk at your tables about where you see your county with respect to questions one, two, and three. Uh, then after that break, we're going to bring up another panel, and we're going to go through questions four, five, and six, then give you again time at your table to talk through where you are. And then you'll see breakout sessions this afternoon where you'll really get a chance to drill down into those particular questions. So that's the way we're organizing the rest of this morning, time to hear more from uh, your counterparts, but then time also to talk uh, among yourselves. And we're really proud uh, of, the, of the two panels that we have here. Um, it is a real true cross-section, I think, of, uh, of counties across the country. Um, we have just on this opening panel and then the panel that's going to follow uh, some very large counties. As you all know, places like L.A. and New York City will be the first to remind you just how big they are. Right here's L.A. front and center. Um, and uh, um, uh, we know that a uh, lot's going on. Um, <clears throat> we also know that there are lots of... Uh, counties that are quite large, that are in the large urban county caucus, places like Bear County, that's San Antonio, Texas, uh, Franklin County, um, that's Columbus, Ohio. And then we also keep reminding everybody how uh, distinct and even unique every jurisdiction is. Imagine this, no county government, no elected prosecutors, no sheriffs whatsoever. I introduce you to Connecticut, um, the state of Connecticut, uh, where you have an entire unified system uh, where the state runs all of the jails and detention facilities. So uh, just to give you a flavor for how every jurisdiction really is unique, um, we'll also be having uh, on our second panel uh, other representatives of Texas, including uh, Dallas County. So a neat cross-section of counties. And then for those of you coming from rural counties um, who really flag the unique challenges that your jurisdiction faces, um, we have a, a Missoula County represented, which I'm sure is to remind us is a big county by Montana standards, um, certainly big geographically, but big population-wise. Um, and that fits in our sort of mid-sized, smaller to mid-sized counties. And then we have, of course, real rural counties that we have special breakout sessions for. So again, reminding ourselves that I know what, what's said at every NACO conference and certainly every CSG conference, if you've been to one county, you've been to one county. Um, so um, with that, I do think that uh, um, <coughs> there are some common themes, and I am thrilled to introduce the panel that uh, we have here today. Uh, first, just starting here on the right, is uh, Commissioner Nicola Ro uh, Rowley. She goes by COLA, um, if I have that right. She's uh, a county commissioner in Missoula County, Montana. Um, she has a background in health, so we're thrilled that she's part of, uh, of this opening panel. Um, to her left is uh, Sheriff Par um, Parmelo, Susan Parmelo from uh, Bear County, uh, San Antonio. I'm sure she's never been introduced as to the left of much, um, but uh, uh, Sheriff Parmelo um, uh, <clears throat> um, is a, uh, a Texas sheriff, and uh, all you need to know about a Texas sheriff is you don't want to mess with one of those, right? Um, but uh, uh, just as further background, uh, if this weren't enough just to have his bio um, of uh, Sheriff of Bear County, before that, uh, she was a top-ranking officer. Um, I'm going to get this wrong, Sheriff. Can you t remind me of uh, in the U.S. Air Force of Major General? Um, so I'm going to make sure I get that right. Major General in the United States Air Force, uh, uh, 32 years uh, in the United States Air Force. Thank you for your service. Um, we're thrilled to have her on the panel, too. Uh, next to her uh, is um, District Attorney Jackie Lacey from Los Angeles. Um, she is the district attorney there with a uh, long background uh, in um, uh, serving as prosecutor. And what we're most excited about is the leadership that she provides on mental health and justice issues, where she chairs a countywide task force in Los Angeles on these issues. And sitting next to her is uh, Dr. Tressman, a psychiatrist um, who is affiliated with the University of Connecticut, nationally known for his expertise um, on dealing with this population. And at the University of Connecticut, that is the entity that is charged with providing health services uh, to all people um, who uh, have health needs who are booked into the uh, Connecticut Department of Corrections. So um, that's our panel for the first session. And we're going to make this interactive. Um, no speeches, I'm just going to be asking questions, um, and we're going to try and keep it short and, uh, and interactive. Um, and uh, Sheriff, I, I wanted to start with you. Uh, our first question in here is about committed leadership. Um, and as Dr. Osher said here, what better evidence of committed leadership um, than all of you just being here, and again, bringing your A-team to this event. That said, I'm sure that each of you would identify people in your jurisdiction that still aren't fully at the table uh, that really need to be in order to make sure that you can realize the kinds of changes you want to make. 
um, certainly a key partner in all this are the sheriffs um, running the jails. And Sheriff Parmelo would love to hear just a little bit from your perspective about what to look for from uh, committed leadership and in particular from sheriffs. What does that look like from your perspective when the sheriff is fully at the table on this topic? You know, as, a, as an elected official, we have a bully pulpit. And frankly, if we don't use it to address issues that affect our communities, then we're not doing our job. And when you look at the data, uh, and frankly, when I became the sheriff just uh, over three, three and a half years ago, I really didn't um, recognize the issue about mental illness. But when Dr. Tony Fabella, Council of State Governments Justice Center, uh, gave me the data that in our jail, about 22% had some level of mental illness, and of those, which, you know, when you do real numbers, that means about 450 people with our population today have been in and out of our jail six or more times. So when you think about that, uh, you know, that gets your attention. And those are the kinds of things that we as leaders need to bring to the forefront and to our public to let them know it is an issue and there are better ways of dealing with mental illness in our communities as opposed to just putting them in jail or prison. So from a leadership perspective, that's what we are hired and elected to do, so we better do our job. Thanks, Sheriff. Uh, Commissioner, I know that you serve on a board in Missoula County. Um, what are the arguments that got fellow commissioners to the table? How are they contextualizing this with all the other things? Uh, Commissioner Sally Clark mentioned, you know, roads, bridges, hospitals, a million different things you're all juggling. Uh, what are the arguments that got them to the table? Um, I think it's, it's, an, it's an easy sell, I think. And it's, it's unfortunate, I think, that we're talking about it, that it's a hard sell for some commissioners. It's something that from day one a lot of us were interested in. But I think one thing that's really easy is to, to relate it to, to what the expectation of the public is for us. Communities care about their poor, their veterans, their mentally ill. Um, and our communities are already doing a lot of efforts in these arenas and contextualizing that with an interest that commissioners maybe already have. And this issue touches on several of those areas. Um, you know, bringing their current interests into this and kind of folding it in and looking at the broader picture of what we're actually dealing with in our communities, I think is a good way to get disengaged uh, people on board a little bit. Um, making sure people understand the issue. It's a stigmatized issue. It's something that sometimes we'll hear from interest groups and, and we're not really applying it holistically to our communities. And I think um, really educating us, bringing us in on it, slowly uh, getting us on board um, before we can really be the pushers and the drivers of it is really important. Um, and convince us that we're needed because uh, the criminal justice system mental illness, all that, that's not really a commissioner's wheelhouse. It's not our area of expertise. And counties do a lot of good business every day without us really being the drivers. And so I think if, if uh, somebody isn't on board, you need to con convince us that we're needed, that we have that breadth of fiscal and community connections and ability to use our bully pulpit and, and um, put together the partnerships uh, and alliances that are necessary. So we are actually a needed piece of the puzzle. I think sometimes it's easy to say, uh, oh, the community is doing that, or oh, the sheriff is doing that, and we don't need to be involved. Um, so those are some pieces I think that are helpful. Thanks, Commissioner. One of the things that we talk about here is a mandate from leaders responsible for the county budget. In, in many jurisdictions, uh, what we hear is, well, well, we'll bring the county commissioners in once we kind of have a plan, once we know what we want to do. Um, and I know, Sheriff, you said no from the beginning. You want to make sure that the uh, county commissioners, the county judge, um, uh, knew what was underway and was anticipating the uh, some sort of plan from you all. How, well, you know, can you walk the group through a little bit um, in terms of engaging the, the people who write the budget? How did you approach them, and how did you make sure they knew that they were going to be getting something early on? You know, one of the yeah, uh, one of the issues is so often, you know, and counties are are. Uh, put together, their organizational structure is put together so sometimes no one's in charge or everyone's in charge. And so often people work in silos and they've got great programs that they're responsible for but they, if they are not integrated, there's redundancy, there are gaps. 
And so unless everyone is involved from a, you know, and moving forward together, then we lose focus. And frankly, uh, if you don't get funding, you don't get it. And so without county commissioners who are focused on priorities and helping them understand how those priorities related to mental health across our communities interrelate to other things that they are doing, then they don't have the picture. So it's important that we help county commissioners and county executives to understand the interaction with the kinds of programs that we care about. Because frankly, if we're spending all this money on mental health in the county jails, then we could be saving money with doing it a different way and spend those dollars on other things that are more productive for our counties. It's about priorities and how we use our resources. Thanks, Sheriff. So we're gonna to turn to uh, question two, but before we do, I just wanna sort of draw everyone's attention up here to the slides and then also to your, your book. Um, again, I think all of you will tell us uh, about leadership being at the table. Uh, we're really probing this a little bit further by saying, is there an actual mandate from the people who write the budget uh, about what's expected? Um, and are they involved at this point? Or are you kind of waiting to bring them in a little bit later? Are they actually fully invested at this stage? Is there a planning team or whatever you want to call it, a committee, a task force that's been established that has all the right people at the table? Um, is there a real commitment to what your goal is? Many times people get a little bit lost, I think, we're here to make sure there's a new screening tool that's uh, put in place. We're going to set up a, a new mental health court. Have you actually locked in on the goal of an overall reduction in the number of people with mental illness in the jail? Is the committee meeting and is that each committee, is it chaired by a person who has some serious juice in the county, who has access to all the right people, who can get things done? Um, is that the kind of person who's chairing each and every of your uh, committee meetings? Um, another question we ask is, do you have somebody who actually can do all the work between the meetings, right? That, that key activity that occurs from one meeting to the next, the kind of staff director, uh, if you will. These are all the characteristics that we talk about when we talk about real committed leadership. Let's go to the second question. Uh, in the book, and we're going to turn here to, uh, to Dr. Tressman, uh, and this is around screening and assessments. Uh, and you'll recall Dr. Osher saying, if we don't know uh, and really have an, a, a true sense of the person's mental health need, their substance abuse need, and their criminogenic risk, um, then we really don't know how to actually allocate our resources. Uh, and he mentioned that he has not been to a county where he's actually found all three of those things in place. Uh, Dr. Tressman, I know you're um, a nationally known expert on these screening tools and assessment processes. Can you help us understand why so many people think they're doing this, but in fact, aren't in fact doing this? Sure, and I've been assured I have an hour and a half, so let's get started. <laughs> um, there are a whole range of challenges that each of you is facing, um, but we're talking, keep in mind, not just about screening, but what are we screening for? We're screening for mental illness, for substance use, and something critically, critically important that each of you goes to bed every night fearing suicide. And we haven't mentioned that word yet, but that is a key element in the overall safety and management of our facilities. So uh, those are the three domains. Now what about those domains? Let me go through the list and then very quickly go back to them. Communication, consistency, confidentiality, quality assurance. And so as we do this, the first, communication, this is where everything breaks down. We think we're doing it, but in truth, when you're talking about everything from the paperwork, what's written on the mitimus, what guidance might have been provided and doesn't get read, what about the judicial marshals or the equivalent who are transporting people from court to the facility? They see a lot. Is there any kind of formal way that information is being documented uh, and effectively being communicated? And then on and on from one shift to another, all of this is part of the process because even if you go through the routine of filling out a document, if that document isn't used in an effective way, it's worthless. Even more so, it exposes you to risk without the benefit. Consistency. 
it's not just a hobgoblin of little minds. It's the critical basis for effective care delivery, whether it's safety and security, which is the bedrock of everything that needs to go on in a jail. But for you to have a safe and secure environment, you need to know who you're working with, and you need to know what the meaningful risks are. So the first is for screening. Again, you're screening for mental health, for substance use disorders, particularly for detox, right, in the acute issue, because that's a nightmare for most people in jails, whether big or little. Then suicide risk, which really needs to be assessed independently and in a focused way. Because simply because someone has mental illness doesn't mean that they're suicidal. And the flip side is absolutely true. Someone with no history of mental illness is now experiencing the humiliation of their first incarceration or their risk of losing their families, the risk of losing their job. That may trigger the acute risk of suicide. So we're screening for all three of those. To do so in an effective way, forgive me for talking so quickly, but I really don't have an hour and a half. Um, <laughs> is that you want something that's valid. As a screening tool, you want something that can be tr you know, your staff can be trained on and you want it to be consistent. There are two instruments that are currently available for use, funded through the National Institute of Justice that are available through the ASCA website and through NIJ. Uh, one was developed by Hank Stedman and Fred Osher's team. The, brief jail mental health screen. The other was developed by Julian Ford and myself and our team, uh, the correctional mental health screen. Both are out there, both are in use across the country. This is one approach for other, for, it's particularly useful in facilities that are small, that may rely on correctional staff to do the initial screening. It is not the be all and end all but these are at least validated instruments. For facilities that have larger staffs, more dedicated staff, they can go far beyond that for screening. But the challenge is you don't want to miss key people, so you want it to be sensitive, but you don't want to refer everyone for mental health screening because you don't have an assessment, you don't have the capacity. So you want something that's both sensitive and specific enough to refer people who need treatment, but not too many folks. How am I doing on time? Uh, you got one more minute to go to assessment, and then I'm going to ask a follow-up question. Okay. So in terms of the assessment parts, um, you want people to be then who need screening, right, for suicide risk, for substance use disorders, particularly for detox in the acute stage, as well as for mental illness. Someone who is also well-trained needs to do assessment and they need to do that in an effective and a consistent way. It has to be done in an area that's confidential. It doesn't mean you need a, a, a beautiful suite with you know, closed walls and all that stuff, but you do need sound confidentiality. Yes, there may be an officer looking from a distance, but people need to feel comfortable enough to share intimate information with someone they've just met while they're distressed. So you do need to come up with effective ways that there could be confidentiality, otherwise it's a worthless process. And finally, you need to have some type of quality assurance process, constitutionally mandated. You've got to have quality assurance, you've got to review it, so you need data to review, you've got to give feedback to people who have been well trained, and you've got to give them the opportunity to maintain their skills. So it's all of those different elements, but the bedrock in all of this is effective communication across the team. The team starts at the court, continues through the marshals, the, co the correctional staff, as well as the mental health and medical staff. Thank you. Wow, that was a lot in a very short period of time. Thank you, doctor. For those of you who really want the full dose, um, that will be later in a breakout session, we'll be really unpacking this particular topic. But let's just sort of review, make sure I'm collecting all this as a, as a non-clinician. Uh, so number one, uh, just because you do a suicide screen does not mean you're actually screening for mental health need. Uh, ditto if you're just doing a mental health screen doesn't mean you've done a suicide screen. So doctor, you want to see both those plus a substance abuse screen, and that's done for all people immediately upon their admission to the facility? Well, so many things need to be done in stages. So you want to do an initial screen to see if there are issues. 
And it, you know, for, even for suicidality, that can be just a couple of very basic questions. But if someone says yes, then they need to be referred for more extensive assessments for both. So we're talking about something that's done, and this is where it gets tricky, right? I think a lot of people will talk about mental health services provided in their jail or suicide screening, but we're talking about a screening process that applies to all people immediately upon their admission. I know many of you are dealing with magistration facilities and lockups, and that raises questions about are we doing this at the lockup versus are we doing this when they actually get admitted to the detention facility. Um, but the, we're talking here about screening. Uh, and then the next issue was the follow-up assessment, and we want to make sure that that's done. Screening doesn't have to be done by a mental health professional, if I understand right, doctor, but the assessment does, and, and you'd like to see that done within how soon of a positive screen. It really depends on this, the context. If someone is acutely suicidal, they can't just be put back in the bullpen and forgotten about for the, you know, a day. So th these are the different issues. We do need to think about some level of triage whether it's immediate, they need to be observed the entire time, because in most uh, lockup settings, there are serious opportunities for people to harm themselves, right? We know this. So we need to be aware of it, we need to manage it, so you need to have processes in place to triage, whether it is immediate, that shift, or if it's more routine within 72 hours. So getting that person to a mental health professional, I know it's going to be especially hard in a rural county where you may not have a mental health professional who's immediately accessible um, in, in pretty tight turnaround times. And for the jail administrators uh, in the room, we appreciate this is a high volume uh, process and lots going on very quickly and you're really frankly throwing them, talking about throwing some wrenches into the mix here uh, in, in terms of making sure that you're moving the machinery that you need to move while making sure that these things happen. We haven't even gotten to criminogenic risk, right? That's a third uh, assessment that we, or, uh, that we also want to uh, make sure happens. Um, but again, we'll be going into more detail on this in the uh, breakout sessions. And I would encourage you to really talk to Dr. Tressman, talk to Dr. Osher, talk to Dr. Stedman, others, and say, this is what we're doing currently. Does that meet the threshold of the comprehensive screening assessment we really need to do? Because time and again, we find that there's actually a gap between what people think is sufficient and what actually needs to be in place. Sheriff, I know you want to jump in with something, but if you don't mind, I'm just going to get to the Commissioner Rowley really quickly. Commissioner, we were talking earlier that in our conversations with some commissioners, they say, well, if we actually do all of the screening for all of these people, we're going to start to see that there are lots of people with mental health need, which is going to present an overwhelming demand for services that we don't even have in our county. Do we even want to know this? Um, you know, what's, what's the, what is your thought uh, on that? And, um, you know, to what extent is that a really real concern for county commissioners? I think it's a, a varying level of concern for different people, and I know a lot of people have become extremely risk averse, especially as far as, well, what if we screen these people and we know there's an issue and we don't do something fast enough and there's an event and we are embroiled in several lawsuits, you know, so there is that issue and I think you just have to balance it with um, there, there are allowances given for doing the best you can and, and really pushing for systems-wide reform and, and moving the needle on this. And we can't do that if we're just afraid of the liabilities and the what-ifs. And so really um, kind of kind of try to balance the risk aversion with the benefit that we can really gain if we start doing this. Dr. Tressman, what's your response to people with those concerns? You know, well, I, I don't know if we can provide a follow-up assessment to all these people, get them connected to services. What's the point of creating this liability for ourselves? Well, I may want to defer to the district attorney to my right. However, the reality is these days, given multiple Supreme Court and district decisions, it's not only what you know, it's what you should know. And we know from national data, from state data, the high prevalence of these disorders and the risks. And so frankly, not doing these screenings is no longer a defense. Thanks, doctor. Um, so I'm going to come back and bring in the sheriff in just a minute, but I want to go to our other law enforcement leader right now, the district attorney from Los Angeles. And uh, if uh, you're like me, you always love the little factoids from Los Angeles that underscore how big that jurisdiction is. How many police departments um, within the county of Los Angeles? I think we're at 48. 48 um, local law enforcement mm -hmm. right, police departments within if, the if county. If you don't count campus police, it's four, only 48. Without counting campus police. Yeah. And, then, and then if you bring in, like, how many judges and courtrooms are you dealing uh, with? Let's see. Judge Gordon, how many courtrooms? 281. Criminal courts. Just the criminal courts. Yeah. 
281 criminal courts, for those who couldn't hear it, within the county of Los Angeles, 600 courts uh, within the county. So, I mean, again, a scale that for many of us is just mind-blowing, a, a nation-state unto itself. Um, <laughs> and uh, <coughs> um, District Attorney Lacey, uh, you're chairing the uh, entire task force for that county on that topic, and I know for many of us who work on these issues, it's exciting to see a district attorney uh, chairing that kind of task force. Uh, your advice to prosecutors um, across the country and your um, thoughts about why a DA should actually be leading this kind of effort. Yeah. Um, well, it, it is interesting to have a district attorney say, let people out of jail who are sick, who, may re who have the highest recidivism rate of anyone, right? Um, and uh, it, it hasn't been an easy sell. Um, it, within my own ranks. As a matter of fact, I particularly chose not to go to my own ranks first because I understood the psychology of why. Uh, when you're the district attorney, you wake up every single morning, and even if you're a deputy DA, and the first thing you do is read the headlines of the stories. And you pray that the most recent person that was on probation who killed someone doesn't have your name attached to it. That's what you, that's your fear. Um, today, for instance, uh, my Orange County partners are here. I am thrilled when I see a case like that and it's your county when I read down there. Because <laughs> like, wow, we didn't make a mistake. The, the public has little tolerance for district attorneys who make mistakes. And a mistake is you take a risk thinking that Perhaps jail or prison isn't the right answer for this. And so um, a couple of years ago, uh, when I took on this issue, I decided that rather than start from the inside, that I would start from the outside. And so um, I basically went around to every community group I could think of and get, made the case for why this was just inhumane. Forget about numbers. It was just inhumane and that we needed to change. And, and, and later, then I would be able to go to my colleagues um, and say, don't worry, the public understands this issue. You're going to be okay. And more importantly, I, as your leader, have spoken a thousand times, and I have your back, and this is just the right thing to do. But the, uh, the data is very important. As district attorneys, of course, and as sheriffs you, and, and police uh, ch uh, chiefs, you would love it when crime rates are down because then you could take credit for it even though you may not be responsible for it. <laughs> you hate it when crime rates go up. Uh, but, but I contend the data we need to be looking at is are we successful and, and are we successful in the punishment that we ask for? And that's where recidivism rate is really the name of the game. If you have high recidivism rates, which we do in LA County, of 60% uh, for uh, defendants who are not mentally ill, but even higher for those who are, then all you're doing is perpetuating the problem when you're incarcerating someone who is mentally ill. And if we can get the public and district attorneys to focus in on, are we reducing recidivism rates? And that's the success we ought to measure. Are we? really helping the person who is involved in the justice system abandon a life of crime forever and get out of our system, then that's really what we should be measuring. So the, the, the recidivism rate is crucial, and you need to know your recidivism rate, and you need to monitor it. So District Attorney, quick uh, follow-up question. Can you just tell the group about the investment that the Board of Supervisors uh, has made in uh, on this particular issue, right. and then as the chair of the task force, what do you think the expectation is from the board of supervisors right. for that investment? Uh, our supervisors voted last year to give this project $120 million, uh, which is amazing because I didn't ask for the money. Uh, but, um, you know, as a matter of fact, I'm thinking to myself, I wish I could have gotten a few other requests in there. <laughs> but. Um, you know, it was, it was kind of interesting. It was almost like Forrest Gumpish, the way that it happened, Michael. Um, the media took an interest in this issue and began to write on it. And then we began to get calls from uh, elected officials. We're, we're ruled by supervisors. There are five county supervisors. And they began to get calls 
uh, about what we were doing, uh, which we tried to keep sort of under the radar for a little bit until we had it together. And uh, so they, they issued it, they came up, they created an office of uh, diversion and reentry, uh, which you know is the first in our county to happen. Um, they appointed uh, Dr. Mitch Katz and myself. Uh, Dr. Mitch Katz leads our health service department to, to really lead it and spearhead it. And um, that was amazing because I, uh, if you listen to TED Talks, and my favorite one is by this guy named Simon, in which he says, whenever you start to do a, a change, start with why. So his famous line is, uh, so when Martin Luther King gave his speech, he didn't say, I have a dream, or I have a plan. He said, I have a dream. We didn't, I didn't really have a specific plan. I just knew it was wrong, what we were doing, that we were incarcerating people who were mentally ill for longer periods of time, that we were doing it out of fear and ignorance, that it just wasn't what many of us who have dedicated our lives to signed up for, to take advantage of those people who are sick. And that law enforcement really were the ones that came to us and said, people just don't belong here in our jails. Can we do something about it? Thanks, Mr. Attorney. So in question two here, going back to the screening and assessment, you can see here a list of things that we're looking for, right? Uh, we focused a lot on the actual tools that are used and then the follow-up assessment. Remember Dr. Osher talking about what's your definition of mental illness and does that align with the counties? How does that relate to the state's definition of a priority population? Um, we haven't gotten here much into criminogenic risk, but we, you remember Dr. Osher pointing out that if you're putting a low risk person in a high uh, intensive supervision, you're gonna increase the likelihood that they uh, reoffend. So how do you make sure you're using risk to focus your resources on those um, high risk people? And then uh, Dr. Tressman talked about how that information is shared. Um, so those are all the things around screening and assessment. If I could go to the question number three uh, next. And here, this is uh, picking up on what District Attorney Lacey was talking about. Board of Supervisors makes a big investment. Uh, assumption here is three years later, they don't want to know, do you have a good tool in place? Um, you know, do you have a special program that's now up and running, right? They want to know, are there fewer people with mental illness in jail? That's what we were paying for, right? Um, well, in, in order to really start to um, be able to explain that, you're going to need to be able to talk about what your recidivism rates currently are. Um, you're going to need to be able to talk about the people who are booked into jail, the percentage that have that mental illness, how long they stay, uh, and, uh, and again, their recidivism rates. And that is data that is not at the fingertips of many counties, and you recall Dr. Osher's slides, according to you all, most of your counties uh, don't have that information, and especially for rural counties, not a reasonable expectation of anything that's going to be generated anytime soon. So how do we benchmark where we are, right, as we're asking for more investments? Uh, how are we going to measure progress? This is incredibly important. I know something that LA is looking at. Sheriff, um, I know in San Antonio, you've made it a real priority just to get that baseline data together and wasn't as easy as, as you'd hoped initially, I know. Well, you know, the question is, what is the definition of mental illness that you want to track? You know, is it things like, um, uh, the number of inmates on psychotropic medications, those who've interacted with mental health authorities. Um, what about PTSD, anxiety? Uh, you know, some of these aren't considered severe mental illness. And so the issue is really in working, and for us, it's been working with the medical and mental health care provider for our jail. But there's also the issue of, well, we're not so sure we'll give that to you because that's HIPAA protected. And so it's working through a lot of these um, issues that you know one uh, structure has and another wants and how do you uh, pull those together. Um, and so the real issue is having good data that everyone agrees on is the definition and frankly, from county to county, it doesn't matter if we use exactly the same data, it's what is appropriate for your jurisdiction. What makes sense for your county? There may already be some measure that you use that is best for your jurisdiction. But we also have different state laws um, 
uh, and those kinds of things that uh, are factored in that direct many of the things we do. But I think too, okay, I have the mic, so I'm gonna do this. <laughs> <laughs> we'll call the sheriff's bio. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, when, when we look at the prevalence of mental illness, I think it's important that we recognize the role that law enforcement has before there's even a mental health assessment made. And i use the example in San Antonio and Bear County. In 2012, it was mandated that all SAPD officers, all Bear County sheriffs, deputies, and other regional agencies are required to have crisis intervention training as they go, uh, as they're prepared for patrol duties. Our detention officers also have crisis intervention training, but our patrol deputies and police officers in our jurisdiction in 2015 alone did emergency detentions on almost 10,000 individuals. So that they didn't even come into the criminal justice system. They were placed into, um, uh, into community resources and handled there as opposed to coming to jail. So that's an important relationship that law enforcement has before they even get to jail or central magistration. And an example of why CIT is so important, I use the example of our mental health unit in 2009. Six years prior to that, on average, 50 times a year, they had to use force taking mental health consumers into custody. That's over 300 times in a six-year period. In almost seven years since that time, and since they were all trained in CIT, three times. 300 to 3. And if that doesn't say it's important, I don't know what does. Thank you, Sheriff. And, and um, then, of course, we've got um, our mental health regional authority, Center for Healthcare Services, help to identify the barriers for law enforcement. And so we have a restoration center today where that saves time for law enforcement, instead of sending, uh, spending 12 to 14 hours in a hospital emergency room, they spend 15 minutes dropping off an individual at the restoration center, as well as our homeless. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, Sheriff raises a great point. You know, we're talking a lot about uh, what percentage of your bookings or what's the number of bookings right now in your jail with mental illness. Part of the strategy to reduce just the bookings are these pre-diversion, these pre-booking options. Uh, many of your largest city police, municipal police departments have specialized training, but as the district attorney points out, many of your counties have multiple uh, local law enforcement agencies. What kind of consistency is there across all of those uh, different police departments and other first responders? So something else to look at, I know, that we'll be featuring during the uh, breakout session. So at this point, I would like you to take out your smartphones, uh, and I know in this day and age, just about everybody's got one. Um, and uh, while you're doing that, I'll tell you a, a quick family story. Um, through, we are on the family plan in our house, you know, uh, the kids, and I'm a father of three, and our two teenagers have these phones now. Um, for, they cause all kinds of controversy that I won't get into, but parents can relate, I know. Um, <clears throat> and uh, through some glitch, whenever somebody in the family downloads a new app, everybody gets it on their phone. We can't figure out what's going on, um, but it's driving everybody crazy. Um, and so uh, further evidence that um, uh, all of our kids, you know, we turn into our parents. Um, uh, I came into the kitchen, and this is infuriating as a parent, and yet I remember it as a teenage boy. Caught my teenage son with the jug of orange juice, you know, just swigging it out from the refrigerator, and just, God, it makes me mad as a dad, but I remember doing it as a kid. So uh, in any event, uh, talked to him, and he ignored the whole thing. He wiped his mouth, and he said, oh, I saw your new app that you got for uh, CSG and the meeting thing. Um, and so that should be on your phone now. He gave me the thumbs up on it, which I was very proud of. Um, but it's the, uh, the uh, application for this conference. And you'll notice when you open it up that there are polling questions there. And we want you now to respond uh, to three polling questions. So let's pull up the first one. Can we pull up the first polling question? Maybe. 
So back to this leadership question. Um, we know that we surveyed folks, but we didn't get into this level of detail in the survey, and only one uh, uh, person from each county was able to respond. But now having had this discussion about what leadership truly amounts to, how would you uh, assess where you are right now in terms of whether your leadership is committed? That's polling question number one. Uh, polling question number two is whether you're conducting timely screening and assessments. And you'll recall everything that we went through on that. We're interested in knowing how you would assess where you are today on timely screening uh, and assessments. Question number three is whether you have that baseline data to enable to benchmark where things currently are and then measure progress against that. So uh, what we're going to do now um, as you answer those questions is give you about 15 minutes uh, just to talk at your table and really discuss where you see yourselves in each of these three areas. Uh, and then we're going to come back, we're going to look at the polling results, and then we're going to go into questions four, five, and six. Please help me, in, uh, join me in thanking our terrific panel.
Are you doing another video or no? Okay, if we can, we're going to go ahead and reconvene. Okay, if we can get your attention, please. Okay, so very much the dynamic we hoped we could create. Uh, clearly, the teams are engaged and you have lots to talk about, which is exactly what we hoped would be the case. Um, now we're going to turn to the second half of our questions. Uh, and let me introduce uh, the second half of our panel. And I told you earlier we had all three time zones uh, represented in different types of jurisdictions. Uh, in this panel now, we have uh, Dallas County represented, uh, Franklin County, that's Columbus, Ohio, uh, and New York City, which is the ultimate hybrid, five counties by some standards, uh, but yet one police department, um, one mayor, obviously. Um, and so we have uh, those three jurisdictions, uh, as well as Dr. Tony Fabello, um, who is a nationally known researcher. Um, I'm going to introduce each of the panelists, and then we're going to um, have some questions. So first, let me just introduce uh, the panel. Uh, Dr. Tony Fabello is the director of research uh, at the CSG Justice Center. He's also working um, with counties across the state of Texas as a fellow with the uh, Meadows Foundation and their Institute on Mental Health Policy. Uh, I've certainly been working on these issues for many, many, many years now, and Tony, uh, thrilled that you're part of this discussion. Uh, sitting next to you, I know, is one of your partners, uh, Ron Stretcher, who is the Criminal Justice Coordinator in Dallas County. Uh, Director Stretcher has been in that position for some time. I know that uh, many of you who have served that function or served that function of, of Criminal Justice Coordinator know how hard that is to be working among so many moving parts uh, in the county. At the same time, can't imagine a county without that position. Um, and in fact, that's precisely the situation Michael Daniels has found himself in, uh, in Franklin County, which doesn't necessarily have a criminal justice coordinator per se, um, but Michael Daniels as the lead staff person to Marilyn Brown, um, uh, who's a commissioner in Franklin County and been the chair of the county board of commissioners there, uh, has run point on a, um, a countywide task force dealing with this particular topic. Michael, we're thrilled to have you here. And sitting next to you is Liz Glazer, um, who is the criminal justice coordinator, so in some ways Ron's counterpart uh, in New York City. Um, and Liz has a long background in criminal justice. She was uh, Governor Cuomo's lead crime uh, policy person, public safety person, overseeing the entire criminal justice and public safety apparatus in New York State, has a background as a prosecutor, so uh, has, brings terrific perspective to these issues as well. So those are our four panelists. Um, and what we're going to do now is go through our second half of questions. Uh, and by the way, I want to remind folks, you'll see that this document is marked draft. Um, in many ways, we're road testing these questions with you and how we unpack them. We'll be interested in getting your reactions over the course of the event, what you think of them, um, and then also how these could be really applied as a tool in your state uh, or in your county. Uh, question four, if I can get that pulled up, please looks at the issue of a uh, process uh, uh, evaluation, a process assessment, um, a process analysis, uh, and an inventory of services. I know this sounds like a real yawner um, and sounds like the kinds of things that everybody has already done. You know, we've already inventoried our services. We know generally what the analysis is, or, or maybe you've been through a sequential intercept planning process and uh, can sort of check that box. Uh, Dr. Tony Fabello is going to talk a little bit here about actually just how complicated this is to do it right and what you learn. So with that, Tony, a little bit about... Michael asked me to try to behave myself, but um, he did not define try very well. So. So I'm going to go for it. Let me tell you what the biggest problem is. It's not necessarily uh, an issue of all this detail. I want to make it as simple as I can. Imagine that you go to the elevator here and you press uh, floor two and you get to floor six. You press four, uh, button four for floor four. You get to the lobby 
and then you press five and you get to floor 10. And you go, there's something screwy about this elevator, <laughs> obviously. And you bring the manager that have been in this hotel for the last 20 years and you tell the manager, I want to go to floor six and he pressed two. I want to go to the lobby and he pressed four. And I want to go to the 10th floor and he pressed five. And he looks at you and says, what is the problem with my elevator? Okay. <laughs> That's what happens when you go to these counties and do this process assessment. Because <laughs> they're so used to their elevator <laughs> that they don't know that when they press two, they're going to six. <laughs> and when they press four, they go into the lobby. And when they press five, they go into 10. And you stand there and say, well, you know, maybe two should lead you to two. And they go, well, you know. The DA wired that elevator years ago, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm not going to tell her, and to me it works fine. And, uh, and I was like, well, you know, if you want to go to the lobby, you should press L. And uh, I go to, well, the judges were involved in that one. <laughs> and uh, you go and talk to 40-some judges in Dallas and tell them that L should be for lobby and not for floor four, and so forth. So one of the harder things to do is go there and depict that process in any rational way and go back to them and say, you know, there are better ways of doing this. And that's exactly what we are trying to do in some of our counties like Dallas, Barry County back there, uh, working for years. And then what happens is once you show them that, then they go, wow. You know, it makes total sense that if you press two, you go to the second floor, <laughs> but we need to have a very, very difficult process here to tell the whoever wired this elevator back there uh, that we need to rewire this thing. Because if we don't do that, as the people come into the system, they're not going to the right floor. I guarantee you that, I've seen it in all these counties, and, uh, and that's the most difficult thing to do. So that's, in a nutshell, not very academic uh, way of describing this process uh, review that we do. Thanks, Tony. And, and I know, Ron, you've been part of this in, uh, in Dallas County. Can you uh, tell the group a little bit about how this process, you've been in this position for many years, you've done mapping exercises before. What was different about this particular analysis and what did it illuminate? I, I, I think for us, the first thing you have to remember if you're going to do this, you need to get about an hour with your key people first and let Tony tell you how stupid you are and how far off you are with doing stuff. <laughs> then he kind of does those works. Then he kind of gets it out of his system and, and, and you move on. Uh, we found this process to be detailed and take a lot of time, but to be absolutely critical to move us forward because you have to have a process where your key stakeholders first come together and agree that there is a problem. That's your first thing, because in many cases, folks do not agree, as you were saying, that there's a problem. The, the, the process also allows you to get out those stories that we all need to tell about why we're here and what we've seen and through the years, and you can kind of get that out and begin to get some shared vision. The, the, if you, when you do your process report, you nearly have to bring somebody in from the outside. It's very, very difficult for an internal to put this all together. Also, you have to go into it and let your ego go and say, okay, there are gonna be some things we've been doing a long time that absolutely aren't working. And as we've gone through ours, there's a couple of little pet projects of mine or others that I thought was the best thing since sliced bread. And before you look at them, well, that ain't working. <laughs> that ain't working. Our report ended up for us with 26 process flags that we needed to go. Some fairly minor, easy to fix, some very, very major. And we now have three work groups going. The key to those working is we have the commitment of the leaders, the sheriff, the DA, our public defender, our commissioners, our judges have all said either we're going to do this ourselves or they've got key people assigned that's making that happen. Ron, can you give an example of what a couple of those flags look like? <coughs> what, what was the issue that came up? And well, absolutely, and the one we're, we're, we're working on right now. The state of Texas put in a new screening form for suicide. We are very fortunate in Dallas, our local hospital system, Parkland Hospital, provides our health care, high, high quality. 
Well, they're doing a, a very in-depth assessment, but for purposes of treatment and where you're at in that. So we're working right now and very close to getting to that point where we kind of marry those two up. Uh, uh, it takes less time, but then we get info to the treatment people that need treatment info, suicidal risk people to the people in the jail that need classification ish information, and then use that to determine who we need to do our full assessments on. Terrific, thank you, Ron. Uh, Tony, um, I know a lot of times people go through uh, exercises and they'll say, well, at this particular stage, we have a, a mental health court. Uh, at this particular stage, we have a diversion program. Uh, so check that box, you know, we've done the analysis, we have an initiative in place. Uh, talk a little bit about your experience in going through that and uh, advice that you'd give to people sitting at tables where they're hearing, we've got something, you know, at that particular point in the process, we're good. Right, and, and, the, the, and again, to be clear and put it in context, there's nothing wrong about having each of these particular initiatives. The problem is that they're oversold. If you, I was talking to the sheriff this morning about the uh, drug courts and mental health courts and specialty courts in Bear County, San Antonio, and since 2010, they have served 1,600 people. So that sounds like a lot until you put it in perspective that during that time, there were 550,000 dispositions in that county. So those courts will not have a gigantic impact on the overall numbers, and that has to be clearly understood. However, they do have an impact on changing the culture. They do have an impact on uh, taking a specific populations and trying to test what is effective with them. And the bigger shortcoming is that because you don't have the elevator working well, when two is two and four is four, the way that people are assigned to those courts are not necessarily the most effective way. And you end up with a lot of low risk offenders that go to the court they have great success, but given the limited resources that are available, those courts should be targeting high-risk offenders, high criminogenic need people, but it's hard to funnel those people there because of the inability to do that because those elevator buttons are not working very well. So all this is tied together. The biggest challenge of all this, and I tell Michael all the time, is that you cannot untangle this spaghetti ball of processes uh, in any particular way to create a huge uh, impact. You really have to look at the whole process and see how you untangle that in a way that you maximize the resources for mental health court, try to pick the right people for the court, try to have the impact uh, uh, that you have on outcomes on that few population, but as you do that, generate enough interest on that particular intervention and evidence-based practices and so forth. Great, thanks, Tony. So you'll see here the question, right? Again, I know many people have gone through exercises where they've mapped what they have, um, where the gaps are. We're asking, have you really taken it to the level that it needs to be taken by really going through every single step along the way? Not just, um, you know, uh, when you look at pretrial, do we have a pretrial diversion program? We look at sentencing, do we have a mental health court? Um, but actually going through, and as Ron said, each time a tool is used, each time information is moving from one decision maker to the next, is it, are we gathering it the right way? Are we sharing it the right way? Are we using it to inform decisions? As Tony's des uh, describing, when you go through that kind of process, it tends to illuminate a lot of wiring things that may need some rewiring. Uh, we haven't really gotten into the uh, gaps in services, uh, but you'll recall Dr. Osher talking about it's not enough just to provide uh, mental health treatment. Uh, we also need co-occurring mental health and substance abuse treatment. And it's not even enough to do that when we're talking about people who also have a host of criminogenic risk factors that need to be treated. To what extent do the providers actually treat all of those things in an integrated way? Few jurisdictions, if any, can really talk about the kind of capacity in the provider community to actually deliver those kinds of services. So these are the kinds of analyses that we're actually talking about in question four. Let us now turn to question five. And with that, I'm gonna turn to uh, Mike Daniels. Um, and here we talk about prioritizing policy practice and funding improvements. And we intentionally didn't talk about just a checklist.
pilot projects or small initiatives to actual system-wide change. Can you highlight a couple of what those uh, system-wide changes have sure, been? Sure, this is the easy part. You just get everybody to admit that they're not putting in enough time, talent, and treasure. <laughs> That's the easy part. Um, when we inherited this a couple, about two, three years ago, um, uh, we were told that the Council of State Government's Justice Center, which we didn't know what that was, was doing a data collection project in Franklin County, doing some of the, the metrics on our data. Um, and uh, my commissioner, Marilyn Brown, who's here, said, why? And um, we went down and, and we were looking at all of this data. Um, and she looked at our director of Homeland Security and Justice programs and said, what are you going to do with that? And the director said, I don't know. Marilyn said, why? Um, and so we took this as a um, needing to go from just a, a data collection and inventory to actually creating um, a system and an implementation that would have a legacy that would that would carry on. Elected officials change, you know, judges change, et cetera, and it really needed to be something that we were going to um, to systemize rather than just have uh, little pieces. I think the biggest thing, Mike, was when you, I, I think getting the commissioner involved and having a champion at that level, um, primarily because they touch all the budgets. Um, the one thing that we can do, like Judge Leifman said, um, you know, I personally don't have much power or authority, but because it says Commissioner Brown's office, when I call people, they pick up the phone. And that really turned out to be very helpful about just convening the right people and getting them in the right rooms and them saying, well, just because we have this and because we have this, we have a system. Well, no, really, we don't. Um, so uh, when you do that, then you realize that there have to be some investments. We have Franklin County has made some investments in terms of, of purchasing computer systems as well as hiring people. But I would say the biggest commitment that we've made is in terms of um, as Ron said, putting our egos aside, putting the right people at the table and saying, what's here, what's working, what's not, what assumptions should we, should we take off the table? And, and what were some of the, again, what was so interesting to us is some of the major system-wide improvements you all have prioritized. I know one has been around uh, screening and assessment and the other in terms of uh, your software system. So our sheriff's department, um, uh, like I suppose many, corrections was sort of the afterthought child of the sheriff's department and it was pretty much kind of a warehousing operation. It was all um, manual paper systems. We've invested in um, an electronic objective classification system to help us do initial screening, make housing decisions. Um, an overall jail management system to then allow us to do further uh, programming and, and assessment, um, as well as uh, to issue a comprehensive um, RFP for medical services that we were able to write in that that not only has to be physical health, but it has to be mental health, and we actually wrote in that a consistency of formulary. So when folks come into the jail who may be on mental health meds, we don't switch them to something different because it's three cents cheaper um, so just, you learn a lot of little things like that and then being able to have the right folks at the table and again, being at the commissioner's office because at some point people come and say, doing this is going to cost more money. Um, I work for, uh, for a commissioner who says, not doing it is gonna cost more. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important. <laughs> One of the things that's so interesting, I know it's it's easy to talk about a particular program or a training initiative or a tool. Everyone can kind of quickly wrap their heads around it. Uh, you all have talked about the personnel that need to be put in place to make sure everybody is actually screened. Uh, it's like a, a couple dozen or so staff, Mike? Was that I, a, I think it's a total of about 20. So 20 positions, right, that have to be put in place to actually do all the screening and assessment. Uh, we talked about recording this information. That's going to require a new information system. Absolutely. The jail <laughs> management system and the objective classification system, just the hardware and software, I think, is around $4 million. Um, to give you an idea, we have uh, 1.2 million people in the county. Average daily jail population is hangs around 2,000, 2,200. Um, so you can scale that up or down based on, on your county's needs. Um, that. That was the, the upfront investment in, in computers and systems. The ongoing investment, like anything else, is right. in the people to run it. Right. Now, I know one of the big things that we're really going to want to unpack here is, so you hear about the prioritization of strategies. Mike talked about uh, the personnel to do the screening and assessments and the information system to support that. They did estimates about the costs of those things. Um, the other issue, though, is really what funding streams are going to be tapped. And I think this is so important. 
um, really asking yourselves, to what extent can Medicaid, for example, really be tapped to cover some of these expenses? And that what was huge for us. We live in a Medicaid expansion state. Yes, we have a Republican governor and Medicaid expansion. Don't, don't fall out of your chairs. Um, we want to keep one and not the other, but that's okay. Um, but Medicaid expansion only works, Mike, if people aren't sitting in the jail. If they're sitting in the jail, the Medicaid expansion doesn't make any difference because they're not Medicaid eligible when they're in custody. So having the Medicaid expansion is one thing, but having either a diversion mechanism or some sort of a pretrial screening mechanism that allows the judges to put people out on recognizance bonds or, or low enough bonds that they can actually get out of jail to, so that they're eligible for that coverage um, is critical. And uh, as a truly nonpartisan organization, both CSG and NACO, you'll make sure we hear the rejoinder to Mike Daniels' comments uh, later on in the, uh, in the health services session. But thank you, uh, Mike. But again, I think what we want to really plow through here is this can't be all county dollars, right, that are coming to the table. How are federal funding streams being drawn on? How are state block grants being drawn on? And then with whatever sort of remaining gaps, those precious few county dollars, how are those best allocated? This is something to be really unpacked during one of the breakout sessions. Um, let me turn to Liz Glazer. Uh, the mayor and his wife, the first lady, have really made mental health a top priority for the city. Um, and I know they've actually put uh, resources behind that, uh, Liz. Can you talk a little bit about what the overall mayor's initiative looks like? And then as the person who's charged with actually implementing it, how you're actually doing that from your position? Sure. So we've had actually kind of two waves of interest uh, and investment in mental health. Um, the first was about a year and a half ago uh, where we put together um, pretty much everyone who touches the criminal justice and mental health systems um, and went through a mapping exercise, uh, really tried to sort of understand from soup to nuts uh, what was going on and what was working. and what was really not working, and then made some big investments in, in each point to try and bring all the system players together and kind of make a system a system. Um, the mayor, not to be outdone, uh, about uh, three months ago, um, took the lens way back on mental health um, and looked at kind of mental health as it affects um, people in every walk of life, not just in uh, contact with the criminal justice system, um, and has invested about three quarters of a billion dollars over the next few years um, in looking at mental health in the schools, in maternal depression, in uh, the violent mentally ill, and what do we do about um, interventions there. Um, and these two things work very much together. And I think sort of one of the things I would say, and it's, I think, every speaker has touched on it, but I just sort of wanted to say it very explicitly, um, is I think this thing that we all kind of struggle with, or at least I know we do in New York, is that we talk about the criminal justice system or the health system, but these aren't really systems. Um, they're sort of disjointed pieces that we're trying to hotwire together, um, and it is that problem is aggravated by the fact that there is no boss of the whole system. We have independently elected DAs and an independent judiciary, except for in the paradise of Connecticut, I understand. But, um, it, and, so, and so this notion, you know, we can say all these things about sort of checking off our list of make sure your leadership is con, 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 you know, uh, committed, I can barely get the word out. Um, and go down sort of the list of six things, which I think are incredibly useful. But at the end of the day, how do you actually make people really want to solve the problem and feel it's their problem and not that other guy's? Um, so I have a few things to say about that in case you ask me a question. <laughs> I do have some follow-up questions on that. I mean, first let me just go, Liz, to, uh, again, resources put on the table. Um, and I know uh, one thing that you all flagged was uh, it was mentioned earlier, uh, Sheriff Parmelo talked about diversion centers uh, where uh, police can take people. And I know that's something that you prioritized, um, you funded, and yet it's, it's not, it doesn't even end with the funding of it. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges of actually rolling that out? Yeah, so um, you think, you know, if you build it, they will come, but first you have to 
build it. Uh, and that means actually getting somebody to want to do the thing, and you can put out lots of money, but if you don't have the skill sets out there or people who are willing to do it, um, you have to kind of rethink how you're gonna do this right now. So, um, so that can sort of play out in a bunch of different ways. Um, one is trying to kind of be a little flexible about how you're solving problems. So if the problem is to try and ensure that um, cops, when they encounter somebody who's mentally ill and really should not belong in a jail, that they have an option or that a judge has an option or a prosecutor, is the only way to do that is a bricks and mortar drop-off center? Or is there another way to do those kinds of things? Um, so we, uh, that's a sort of issue that we face every day is how you actually implement the idea. It doesn't, and sometimes people have to kind of be pried away from the thing that they've wanted to do for 20 years, but maybe no one wants to build that thing or do that thing. Yeah, Dr. Osher talks a lot about, okay, you've made the allocation of resources. Does that mean people actually have the skill set to provide all the services that you've just said that you want to pay for? Do, do the providers think you're actually paying a competitive rate for that? Um, you know, are they actually willing to bid on it? Uh, I know, Tony, we've talked about uh, actually taking these things to scale. You put out large RFPs, and lo and behold, no one can scale up that fast. Um, so, uh, Liz, from where and, you sit... And there's one other thing. So, and this may be a high-class problem, but um, the question is, do you actually have enough people to do the thing you want to do? So, we've gone very big in New York for what... I guess I would call kind of the civilianization of this problem. It's not a cop problem, it's not a DA problem, it's a problem where um, social workers, clinical staff, and others could intervene. We are now at the point with our investments where I think we've maxed out the market in social workers, uh, literally. There, people aren't graduating fast enough and getting licensed fast enough for the number that we want to hire. And we're, and we're competing for them. Um, as, as we look at, at managed care, for instance, um, there are, are a lot of folks, case managers, social workers, uh, clinicians, who are going into the managed care business and they're getting paid much, much more than they are at our social services organizations. And so we're seeing that um, introductory turnover. I mean, the case manager or, or the case worker is the, this person may, coming into the jail, may have never been connected to services. Um, we get them connected and the first person they meet is that caseworker, arguably the most important person in the process. But if that turnover is happening every 90 or 120 days because we can't make the investment to pay those folks, they end up, you know, it's a high stress job, it takes a lot out of you. And if we're not taking care of our frontline case managers and social workers, and that turnover is high, then we have an uphill battle to climb with the best system implementation. Ryan, yeah, you wanted to comment I, on that? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think on a bigger level uh, of what we're talking about here, you must include your behavior health delivery system, however that is, and that's different everywhere. In Texas, we're not a managed care state. I mean, we're not a Medicaid expansion state. We're kind of fortunate in, in, in Dallas in that I'm also a commissioner's appointee to our local mental health authority and I'm chair right now. We've had a system that's worked for a long time that the state is requiring us to, to break apart and, and, and do differently. And having all of the players, the providers as, and your hospitals involved in this process has been critical. They were there from day one on the mapping and that because you can get everything worked out on our end, and if you don't have the right handoffs out into the community where they are trained and aligned with what we're doing in criminal justice, it won't matter. Because I think we have all operated for many, many years on the concept that our problem is we're not making enough treatment available. And so you can begin to make the treatment available but you may not get folks going there because it's not what they thought they needed or located where they're needed. And so often the folks in the behavioral health treatment world don't understand all the complexities of someone in a criminal justice setting. And when you're in a program or a specialty court, 
you have to go through those supervision at the same time you're going through your recovery activities and those don't always match. So it is critical you get not only your leadership but your providers at the table from day one if you want to be successful. Tony, I know one of the things you found in looking at, at Dallas County was, I believe, uh, 20 spots where a police officer could potentially drop off someone with mental illness to process them through the justice system for referral for mental health services. There were two spots that accepted adults, one that accepted youth. So, uh, you know, back to your point, Ron, about really making sure there's that partnership with the behavioral health community. Tony, to all the, the county commissioners in the room um, who keep hearing about the enthusiasm um, uh, of all of their leaders in the justice and behavioral health system. They're putting together a project. They're setting up um, a new initiative. Uh, you know, we heard about LA and a, a big investment that's being made there. For those county commissioners, what do they track uh, in order to see if, if things are actually having their impact that it's supposed to? Uh, well, first they want, they need to want to track. <laughs> so that's the first thing, you know, is the elevator gonna go up or down or crash? Mm. And, uh, and, and this is really important. So I think that's the, I don't know if we jump to the next question, but if you don't put a mechanism to track at least some of the major matrix, matrix here, the numbers, you will never know if the elevator went up or down or sideways. And, and it's really important. And that's something that I give credit to Ron and uh, people in Bear County, uh, Mike Losito there, Commissioner Brooks in Tarrant County, where to their initiative, and, uh, and this is an idea, I won't take credit for it, we uh, got all the counties together to start uh, measuring recidivism the same way across these five counties. Same definition, same set of data, same evaluation by risk. We already have a three-year recidivism for Dallas, about to finish Tarrant County and by the end of the year, we'll have uh, uh, three different groups for three years, one, two, three years recidivism rates tracking all these counties, and it's very eye-opening because what is eye-opening is the recidivism rate has not changed much, <coughs> you know? And what is very eye-opening, the, re the three-year recidivism rate is very high. What is really eye-opening is that after all this talk about evidence-based practices, uh, if you look at the high-risk population, that is supposed to be the target of evidence-based practices, the three-year re-arrest rate for those people are 55, 60, 65 percent, depending on the population, up as high as 77 percent for our state jail population. So this is going to trigger already a whole set of conversation at the county level. Why? Where is it that we need to pay attention? What are the programs that we're funding under the pretends that they're going to reduce recidivism, and can we track those to make sure that that is happening? And um, take it to that level. In terms of the buttons of the elevator, you need to have a matrix where you're constantly tracking uh, if, you, uh, if the plan is to connect the buttons to, for one to one, two to two, uh, is that happening? And we are doing that now, for example, in Bear County, trying to track how we have connected those uh, buttons in the elevator, and uh, when we look at the numbers, we know that there are some issues there. Uh, a, a big chunk of the population is not eligible for pretrial release, and that's an active fact, not only of state law, but in great part of the local uh, policies by the judges that this population, and a lot of them are mentally ill, uh, cannot be released on PR bond. They can be released on commercial bond with no treatment, but they cannot be released on PR bond. So, Tony, just so give we an know the numbers, and we're looking at that. To give try an to example of eligibility criteria where you know people think they've got a program, but then it turns out that half the people are excluded from it because they don't meet eligibility criteria. What's an example of a right? It's eligibility and what I call attrition. So, if you look at my buddy's story, guys, I warn you that I was going to do this, and I love them to that, and they will hate me after today. Uh, <laughs> But uh, take the March numbers that we're working on, and, and again, I'll put it in the right context that we're looking at this to make it better, and they, they, they are committed to do it. Uh, in Bear County, we screen about uh, everybody coming in into the system, about 4,000 people. 650 were uh, um, potentially mentally ill. That's about 18%, which is right on the mark. But half of those are not eligible for pre-trial PR release, personal reconnaissance bond. And part of that eligibility issue 
is a local policy. So we're looking at that because right there you're excluding half of those. The other half then went to a full assessment, but there is a lot of attrition because the buttons in the elevators are not connected uh, you know, correctly. Uh, so, uh, sometimes there are no clinician because we ha have yet to put a 24-7 clinician there. Uh, so those people fall through the crack. Uh, sometimes because of obsolete processes, they time out, they need to go to jail. So they did not do the full assessment. Uh, sometimes they refuse. So out of the 295 people that were eligible for pretrial release, PR release, uh, 144 were eligible for uh, a full assessment, and a full assessment was done. And then 52 were submitted for the judge for a pretrial release decision. And again, there was a set of attrition there that we know what it is, and it has to do a lot with the processes. So at the end of the day, after all that, only 35 people got released on a mental health bond run that is required by state law. We have a state law in Texas for 22 years that required these processes to take place. And if you are not a nonviolent offender, if you're gonna get commercial bond, you should be released on a PR bond and connected to treatment. So out of the 650 pe people that were potentially mental health uh, um, uh, problems, uh, 35 got released to a PR bond and connected to treatment. A bunch of them got released in commercial bond and never connected to treatment. And that's okay, right? Because the judges are now making decisions, so they go, it's not on me. They pay the, the fee and they get out. But they're not being connected to treatment, and they're gonna come back and, and, and loop around and loop around. And the point not to pick on my good friends, because they're doing a hell of a job trying to fix this elevator, is that if you don't have this in front of you constantly, and we look at these numbers monthly, monthly we're looking at these numbers, and we're trying to refine them because not all the systems are in place to generate the right numbers at the, in the right timing. If you don't see that, and if you don't have the groups like they do to try to fix it, uh, it will never get fixed. That is, I guarantee you, it will never get fixed. And for someone now who's been working on, on this particular issue for 20 years, I can tell you this is still what gets me excited and want to work on these things. That uh, we're now at this point where we've moved past particular uh, tools, particular practices, particular programs, and you've got county leaders looking at the overall numbers and saying at the end of the day, we thought we were going to serve hundreds, but we've ended up with a few dozen. What, what is going on with the system where we're ending up filtering out all these populations? What's happening? And really trying to drill down to that so that ultimately we can have a system level impact. That's what this event is really looking at. We'll have one last question for Liz Glazer. Liz, you mentioned um, <coughs> this isn't really a system. This is all these independent actors, um, you know, who are uh, somewhat interdependent, um, but at the end of the day still work pretty inter independently. Uh, your charge is to try to get them kind of moving in the same direction. You've got a lot of counterparts in the audience. Uh, any thoughts about what's effective um, in trying to really kind of harness that machinery and get it moving in the same direction? So this will seem like a total setup, um, but it, it's the data. That is, if you can make the data not be an exercise in whose fault it is, which it can often be. Like people keep the, you know, one thing is just getting the data. Everybody's got the data, just everybody has it separately and they keep it like baseball cards that they may or may not trade with you. Um, so if you can convince people that it's a safe place, that's the first thing. Um, actually, people have never actually looked across the system panoptically. And so they don't know. It's not just that, oh, it's that guy's fault. They, if they can see it all at once from kind of A to Z, it actually becomes a diagnostic. And data ends up, I think, being the glue and the problem-solving tool. That was a perfect sound. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> um, um, and uh, My pleasure. I think now we go back to our safe space at the tables. Um, and we're going to go and we're going to address these last three questions. Uh, and again, I'm going to ask you to pull out your phones and do a little bit of polling. And then um, we're going to ask you to talk for a few minutes. We're going to give you the poll results. And then we're going to move on to lunch. Uh, so if I can pull up question four.
Okay, can I get your attention one more time, please? of you uh, saying working on this but still have a ways to go. Question number four, have you done that really comprehensive process analysis and inventory of services? Again, about a hundred of you, uh, this is uh, saying that you still have a ways to go on that one. Two last questions. These are and I think these are the hardest ones, prioritizing practice and funding improvements. This is where nearly everybody says they have a ways to go. And then lastly, in terms of tracking progress, uh, I thought that that panel was so helpful in terms of how are we going to know what kind of impact we're having. If we're not tracking progress, that's going to bring everybody together. Lots of you saying you don't have that data yet in place. That needs to be a priority. Well, I think that sets the stage well for our afternoon sessions, right? Lots of work to do, but the good news is, is that we have lots of smart people in this room, um, lots of inspiring things happening in different jurisdictions across the country, and the breakout sessions are organized according to each of those questions. So you'll have time to really send different team members two different questions. I hope that you'll divide yourselves as county teams and spread yourself up across the different questions. And then, not yet, just two more minutes, please. Um, you'll also notice uh, that at the end we have uh, this afternoon, time for you to interact with your peers. So you have a session that's organized for you to meet with judges or court officials or jail administrators or rural jurisdictions. So that's an opportunity for you to network with people who share your perspective. One of the things I really want to thank APAF for is the ability to not only provide you lunch, but we all go to lunches where then we have to sit through four more luncheon speakers. Not today. Um, you actually get time to spend among your teams there's a box lunch that's outside, and you can grab your box lunch, and hopefully you'll use it to spend more time with your team, keep talking about these issues. Uh, and then at, at 1.30, we need you to make sure you're in your breakout room. So about 1.15, lunch ends, and we'd like to see you in the breakout rooms at 1.30. All the directions should be in your conference materials. It's been a great morning. Really looking forward to this afternoon, this evening, and tomorrow. Thank you all very much.